Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. We had an election. I voted. The Republicans suffered a disaster, right? The Democrats are on the way back, right? President Clinton won big, right? Ken Starr lost big, right? Well, maybe not so right. Look at this from the New York Times. The Republicans got more votes than the Democrats. There is an interesting argument going on. Joining Think Tank to argue with me about it are David Frum, senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and author of What's Right, The New Conservative Majority and the Remaking of America, and E.J. Dion, visiting senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and author of They Only Look Dead, Why Progressives Will Dominate the Next Political Era. The question before the House, the voters said what? This week on Think Tank. All right, let's get our panelists on the record. Here's what E.J. Dionne wrote in his column in the Washington Post. The 1998 election promises to transform politics in the last two Clinton years, and the 1994 Republican revolution is over. And here's what David Frum wrote in the Weekly Standard. The campaign of 1998 was not only a bad Republican defeat, it was a personal triumph for the president. Here's what I think. Let's go to the numbers. All 435 seats in the House of Representatives were at stake. The Republicans won 223. The Democrats won 211. In the United States Senate, the breakdown before the election was 55-45, and that's what it is now. Among the governors, the Republicans started with 32 and they ended up with 31, but the Democrats didn't gain any. The new seat went to an independent, Jesse the Body Ventura of Minnesota, now known as Jesse the Winner Ventura. They will stop their partisan party politics and start doing what's right for the people. The Democrats did capture four net state legislative chambers, and they captured 45 legislative seats in state legislatures. That's a gain of 0.61%. Well, that doesn't look like any big win for anyone, so why all the talk of a big Republican defeat? Expectations and spin. Well, we leave it to the audience to determine whether or not our distinguished panelists are spinners or expectation mongers. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us on Think Tank. Uh, David, let's start with you. You say it was a big loss, yet the Republicans won a majority of the vote and they won more House seats. Well, I think it is, it's, it's a question of trajectory, that when a, Repu when a party loses House seats in an off-year election, um, it, and when every historical indicator would suggest that it ought to win, that that's bad. So it's not, it's not, well, they lost five and five isn't so many. It's they lost five, they had every reason to expect to win 10, 12, 15, and so their, their, to their net loss, as you might say, is actually much bigger than, than it looks. It's especially, it's a loss too, because this was a year in which uh, the, they were competing against the background of a presidency where the President of the United States very probably uh, committed serious crimes. Okay. E.J., what do you make of these uh, numbers? Right. You're absolutely right if you want to say that there is a status quo element in this election. There always is. Incumbents almost always get reelected. That was no different in 94, and it was the same this time. I think what happened, I agree with David on the point of the trajectory, that what you had is a big Republican victory in 1994. Again, in that election, incumbents won, but it was a huge victory for them. The question was, were they going to solidify those gains and extend them or not? Half of the, that gain is permanent. The Republicans have changed the political face of the South. That's with us. That's going to stay with us. What they failed to do um, is, is solidify that even more and to extend those gains elsewhere. In both 1996 and 1998, the Democrats started clawing back gains in the Northeast, the Midwest, and the Far West, in California, in Washington State, places like that. And so I think this election suggests that 
what people thought was a permanent Republican ascendancy is definitely not, and that we are in for a real dogfight over the, co the coming years words, for control of our politics. The news is something that didn't happen. Well, the news is something that happened in the open seats and in the most competitive seats, most of them tipped to the Democrats. That's why they gained five seats. If this election were meaningless, Newt Gingrich would not have been deposed. Republicans were very upset, and I think the behavior of politicians actually does tell you something about the meaning of elections, well, let, and the let, Republicans let, let, were let's, clearly very upset. Let's go to Newt Gingrich for a minute. Uh, from the, and I guess I'll ask this to you, E.J., because you tend to support the Democrats somewhat more than David does. <laughs> That's fair. From, <laughs> from a Democratic point of view, if you are looking ahead to the year 2000, would, would it be better for the Democrats to have lost five seats and kept Newt Gingrich the target, Newt the target up there, or to have gained five seats and now have the possibility at least of Bob Livingston as speaker, Jennifer Dunn as majority leader, J.C. Watts as conference chairman, I mean a, a holy re... George Bush as the putative moderate centrist conservative hero. Um, didn't the Republicans get the world's cheapest lesson? Oh, I agree with you entirely that the Democrats are going to miss Newt Gingrich as a target, and they're not going to have the same kind of target uh, in Mr. Livingston or in any of the rest of the Republican leadership. The question is, did their gains this year change their own perception of themselves and their opportunities? And I think they did. Dick Kephart, instead of running against Al Gore, may run again as um, minority leader so that he can be the speaker. He may stay there. Democrats are going to find it much easier to raise money because a lot of people who, who sort of cover all their bets are going to look and say, gee, a Democratic majority is possible, and they're going to find it a lot easier to recruit candidates because they may be able to take a majority. Well, I would, I would say when, when I wrote that it was a personal triumph for the president, it needs to be understood that that implies that it is not, which is that it was not a party triumph for the Democrats. And I think that one of the things that we should not be blinded by is that it's possible for a party to lose an election without the other party actually <laughs> making a gain. Um, the Republicans lost this election. But just again, because I'm warning you, for one, every time you guys say they lost an election, I am saying that I may put up on the screen Republicans 51, uh, Democrats 49, and so forewarned, but go ahead. You okay. want to talk about them losing an election, be my okay. guest. Right? I, I, I think there, that you could probably find uh, battles in the Civil War where the North took more casualties than the South, and yet the, the Southern troops ran away afterwards, and the, 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 uh, uh, the, they felt that they'd lost the battle even though they had fewer casualties. I mean, it's not just a matter of the number of, of body bags. On that theory, the United States would have come home and triumphed from, from Vietnam. And there are psychic and psychological and larger elements to a defeat that go beyond, go beyond the numbers. But here's the, here's the Democrats' problem. They, they won this election, I think they did win, uh, they, they won it because the Republicans failed to convince the public that what President Clinton did was a serious enough threat to the Constitution to, to support the Republican impeachment inquiry. So Democrats turned out in surprisingly large numbers to protect their president, exactly the opposite of what was supposed to happen. But, but turnout, turnout was on the low side, no, that's as, right, but, as, as but, predicted, right, right, despite but, all the Pundits right. said, the expectation saying, oh, was, look, it turned out so big. Look what's happening. And turnout was 30, what, what is it, EJ? 38, the last I saw. I There's there a, a couple lower, of numbers yeah. floating around, right. 36 and 38. 36 and we, it's hard to count. Right. For Republican numbers were supposed to be up, and Democratic yeah. numbers were supposed to be depressed. And Democratic numbers were not depressed. And one reason that, that Democratic numbers were not depressed, I would say the most important, was that Democrats were not ashamed to turn up and vote for uh, the party of Clinton and the party that had protected Clinton, that they, in fact, they had no compunctions about that. Um, I think they should have had compunctions about it, but they didn't. Uh, the, the, that, that, however, does not imply that we are in for a new era in which democratic ideas have become more acceptable. And, in fact, one of the things that I think is sort of noteworthy about this campaign on the democratic side is uh, the horror that Democrats still have about offering any ideas that, 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 that while they understand they have some, some tactical ways to defeat Republicans and while Republicans have some vulnerability, that this uh, election I think exposed in a very dramatic way how the price of victory for Democrats is to have no content. And 
Uh, I thought the argument was the, that the, the Republicans didn't show any content. See, I, yeah, I half agree with David in this sense, that there is a tension in the Democratic victory that Democrats are going to ha have to resolve. On the one hand, they won a number of districts, especially in the South, people like Ken Lucas in Kentucky or Ronnie Shows in Mississippi, by nominating moderate to conservative candidates in moderate to conservative districts. On the, the other the Democrats side... Democrats nominated uh, so, some, some candidates who are quite far to the religious right. The Democrat, Martin Frost said, anybody who wins the primary, we're supporting. And there were a number of Democratic candidates. Who Although, interestingly, they, they tended not to get the support of the formal religious right. But yeah, there were pro-choice, I mean, pro-life Democrats out there yeah. running in pro-life areas. That's, right. that's, that's on the that's one side. On the other right. side, what you had is a Democratic victory built on mobilizing the base and some of the most liberal elements of the base, African-Americans, union members, environmentalists. And so the Democrats proved in this election that they could be pragmatic enough to nominate moderates in moderate districts and to mobilize the base. How they keep that going is a question, but I disagree with David on is the notion that the Democrats had no issues. In fact, if you go back to President Clinton's State of the Union message, he laid out a series of issues that Democrats all over the country ran on. I was out there and heard them use those issues. They included more federal spending on teachers and school buildings. They included a health care bill of rights. Child care was mentioned in some race. In other words, the Democrats presented a program that said, we're not going to offer you mounds and mounds of new government, but we are going to use government in certain areas to solve problems. EJ, I, it isn't they didn't, didn't have issues. They didn't have ideas. Uh, to say, for example, on the, uh, you're right about that they had three top issues, Social Security, Patients' Bill of Rights, and the Federal Aid to Education. Social Security, everyone understands Social Security is in crisis. President Clinton says, let's use the surplus to save Social Security. That's my issue. How precisely, Mr. President? Well, there, don't ask me about that. No ideas. Patients' Bill of Rights. The country has two big health care problems. One is that the health care, uh, the rise in the cost of health care after slowing in the mid-90s is picking up speed again and while large numbers of people remain uninsured. That Patient Bill of Rights, whether you think it's a good idea to give more money to trial lawyers to sue people or not, is completely irrelevant. I mean, just, I mean, laughably irrelevant to what everyone acknowledges, and especially Democrats, as the core problem. And finally, on education, that if there is anybody left in this country who believes that the a most important American education problem, or that any American education problem can be solved by more federal money for bricks and mortars, or more federal money for union for uh, for teachers union members. I, I I'd be curious. No, I mean, I mean I, I, it's for teachers, some of whom are in, in the union and some of whom are not. I mean, it's not they don't have to be union members to take it, to be taken to take advantage of the not hundred thousand teachers, but the thirty thousand teachers that mm -hmm. are, uh, will will be under local control. Right, and that, that see, I don't think the electorate views the 100,000 teacher or the bricks and mortar issue that way. Bricks and mortar are actually a huge problem because there is a mini baby boom going on. People have read Ben's books about the good thing about having kids. And there's a mini baby boom, and you need more schools. And lots of local authorities say, gee, we can take that federal money without having lots of regulations. And similarly on Social Security, the old Social Security system has a lot of support out there in the country. A lot of Democratic candidates took advantage of it. E.J., yeah. e. hold on. I want to I ask E.J. something. We're talking about expectations. David said the uh, expectations for the Republicans were high. They missed a big chance. Uh, earlier this year, about in the spring, the Democratic spin was, hey, you know, we can take the House. Now, uh, that didn't happen. So depending when you take the spin point, you could say, well, the Democrats said they were going to win the House. And look, they didn't win the House. They lost. Let me make part of your case, which I think Thank you're, you're, you're right help. in the sense right. that Democrats um, looked at the array of these seats. They had a big advantage because the open seats weren't in the South. It wasn't seats that were probably going to tilt Republicans someday. A lot of the open seats were Republican seats where no one was running for re-election. So Democrats looked at those numbers and said, we can do pretty well in this election. The analysis of June turned out to be right, but it's still significant that this Clinton event intervened. A lot of people thought the country was going to make a strong judgment again against Clinton, and the country didn't do that in this election. This historical idea that the party out of power uh, the, the, uh, always loses seats in the off-year election and most particularly this six-year itch idea is that in the second term of a presidency in other words six years after that president has been uh, been in office it's been since 1820 or something since uh, except for this year that the president's party actually gained seats in my judgment the root and fiber of that law is 
based on the fact that typically a president in his second term, where this is applied, wins big. Ronald Reagan, Richard Nixon, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, a big, t and, and as they say the, in politics, the ferry brings in all the garbage. In comes the ferry into the slip. A lot of candidates who wouldn't get normally elected come in on the president's coattails. The next time they're up and the president isn't there and the, those seats erode. Now, Bill Clinton did not win a landslide. He won 49% of the vote in 1996 and pulled in all of three congressmen. So all bets are off in that election. This idea that we broke some great historical precedent is mostly blowing smoke. Okay. The, n the 1994 election was the sixth year election. The Republicans gained those seats. But the significance, I think, is the trajectory, as David said earlier. In 1996, Democrats chipped about, I think it was nine seats off the Republican majority. They chipped another five off now. And so what you've got is not a Republican era in the making, but a situation where the two parties are close to parity and are fighting for long-term dominance. That's very different than the pictures people I'll buy that. than what people I'll saw in 1994. Yeah. yeah, I mean the idea that uh, it was a tremendous Republican disadvantage in 1998 that President Clinton was so unpopular in 1996. Yeah. I think it's a very elegant mm -hmm. argument, but I, I I'm not sure I find it convincing. I mean, in many ways, with this, with the um, if you were to look for a historical par parallel to the politics now, I think maybe the relevant decade is the 18. 80s. I mean, that, that we tend to think after the Civil War, the Republicans were the dominant party, and yet uh, Ulysses, even Ulysses S. Grant won the presidency by tiny margins, and, and both times uh, tiny margins. Um, it, took, it took an entire generation for the Civil War to be assimilated and for the Republicans to then become, after 1896 and for the next 40 years, the, the, almost 40 years, the dominant power party of government. I mean, I think, I wonder whether there isn't something similar going on now, which is the country went through a trauma not as big as the Civil War, of course, but an equivalent trauma in the 60s and 70s. It is digesting it. Um, the Clinton scandal became and took on, although it began, and many of us who were most hostile to Clinton believed it ought to have been confined as a legal and constitutional issue. It took on larger cultural overtones. Um, and the country has not come to a final verdict on that cultural episode. If if the country decides in the end to assimilate and accept uh, what happened between 1965 and 1975, then I think the Democrats are well positioned for the future. If the country looks back on it, and I think as now that the people who are in that period arriving at full maturity in their 50s, if they decide that that was a sorry episode, then that, that place the Republicans you, you talked about tiny majorities in the 1880s. What always astonishes me in these things is that all the spinners and all the pundits, and sometimes even including me, sit around and say, well, this is what's going to happen, and this is what happened, and the American people spoke, and you were talking about typically the swing on this kind of thing is less than 1% of the electorate. I mean, it, I, I don't have the actual numbers, but I, I, I w heard one that if 14,000 votes throughout the country switched in the right places, the Republicans would have gained seats. That sounds about right. I mean, you can always take the... Well, the same was the, true in 94, even, which that, was clearly right. a Republican and, victory. And, and so um, when people, I, I mean, because of the genius of the founders with the single-member district and the winner-take-all, you can say, oh, look at all these seats we won. But in point of fact, even the case I'm making, 51-49 Republican, hey, big deal. You know, that is uh, a lot less than a thunderstorm. But I think you have to look at the facts on the ground. First of all, I disagree a little bit with David on the 60s. I think the country has assimilated the 60s. They've decided what they like about them, which is civil rights, feminism, a little bit uh, more cultural openness. They've also decided that they care about intact families and the like. I think we've already made our peace with the 60s, this episode with Clinton notwithstanding. But I think that the facts on the ground matter. What the Republicans, the way the Republican leadership has interpreted this election tells us something. The fact that you have a very large fight now going on with the Repu in the Republican Party, a two-front civil war. On the one side, you've got social conservatives and economic conservatives who said the party didn't stand for anything, didn't have any issues. Then you've got, if you will, the George W. Bush wing of the party saying, we need to be more pragmatic, more optimistic. And that fight's going to go right into the year 2000, yeah, so but, that but, but the Republicans I, okay, I'm, have I'm, new I'm problems, glad, some of them the problems of a party struggling for a majority, but there's still problems. I, I'm glad you brought that up, because uh, I was going to bring it up. Um, the, uh, th those sound contradictory, but I don't think they are. George, George Bush, uh, George W. Bush and Jeb Bush are moderate conservatives, and I would stress conservative rather than moderate. They have, uh, 
they, they have put a uh, it's conservatism with a human face, and, and they they are making the case that it sells in the in the Hispanic community. It's, it should sell in the black community, but they are in, in that sense uh, that they are not mushy country club Republicans, are they? They're not mushy, uh, but what they what they are not, and what especially George W. Bush is not, are conviction politicians. Um, and that one, one of the things that has been... Uh, he, he, he cut taxes. Why is that not conviction? Uh, I mean, because, uh, because if you know George Bush and know his career, you can just as easily imagine George, him doing... George W. George Bush. W. Bush junior. Junior. I mean, doing right. exactly the opposite. I mean, that, that I... Uh, there are... Uh, the, the number of issues... I mean, all pol politicians are politicians, and even Ronald Reagan would bend in the face of poll numbers. And Newt Gingrich. And, yeah, even Newt Gingrich would. But there are politicians... And, and did. Who, Right. There are politicians. Uh, I would not, by the way, describe Newt Gingrich as a conviction politician. I think he was he was mesmerized by polls. There are politicians who 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 do what they do uh, within the bounds of reality as dictated by public opinion, but who nonetheless are motivated by an internal gyroscope. And there are politicians who are governed by externals. And th that those, I think, regardless of whether you're social or economic conservative or whether you're conservative or liberal, those are the two broad families of politicians, and there is an endless conflict between them. And uh, I think that there are that that one of the things that is strange about this label moderate that is being applied to Republicans is some of the people who are described as moderates, like John Engler, I think are conviction politicians, con um, con conviction conservatives, conviction conservative, with, but with, with a happy face and and, and with a point with, that, and, that and with this confidence. is not anti-poor people or not anti-minority right. or anything else. But I'm doing this because right. I'm, I'm governor of Michigan, says Angler, not just because I enjoy being governor, not just because it seemed like an right. interesting line of work, and because <laughs> I then have looked around at what my state believes in and I'm doing what it wants. I'm here actually in the face of some adversity in a, in, the, in a normally democratic state, and I'm transforming it. I'm not being a fool about it. I'm not defying opinion, but uh, I'm doing what, what I want. I'm doing what I believe is right. I don't think that, that describes uh, the, the George W. Bush. Governors all over the country have a big advantage. They had a very good economy, and voters like two things. They like programs in the areas they like, and they like tax cuts. And guess what? In a really good economy, you can cut programs, uh, you can cut taxes, and you can spend mon more money on things like education. That's what George Bush did. The question is, is that governor's formula translatable at the national level? The second thing about George Bush is he's very consciously um, not wanted to put a hard edge on the social issues. He went out of his way to say that gays were welcome in the Republican Party, not a particularly popular position with uh, Republican social conservatives. Where I agree with David is it's not clear to me yet where the, when you pick between moderate and conservative, when you pick between pragmatic or philosophically committed, I'm inclined to think he tilts more toward the pragmatic and the moderate. He was giving speeches on education that sounded just like Bill Clinton's speeches. We have to have kids reading by the third grade. And, and Nothing Bill wrong Clinton's with that. speeches sounded but, just like the earlier Republican speeches. Just to, it was just coming together in a certain, a certain right, moderation. Right, right, and yeah. that's why in the fight in the Republican Party to go back to it is so interesting right, because me, you do I, have I, I, those on, two we, we are running out of time. I'm going to give you each one shot. One more piece of data. They are already doing pairing polls looking to the future, George W. Bush, uh, re-elected landslide governor of Texas versus the vice president of the United States, allegedly a big winner in this election, Albert Gore. Uh, depending on which poll you read, George W. Bush is beating Albert Gore by somewhere between 12 and 20 points. CNN had a poll, I think they had a, a Bush 20 points ahead. Look ahead for me, each of you, you have less than a minute each. Tell me, what does it mean? What are we going to see between now and the year 2000? And you are entitled to make a prediction if you're foolish enough. Um, my view is that the one Republican who does have a chance to beat Al Gore is George W. Bush. And that's why a lot of conservatives who may agree with David's critique will still line up behind him. If the Republicans don't nominate George W. Bush, I think uh, Al Gore is uh, very likely going to win. It's going to be much harder for any of the others to beat him. Um, the, someone. I think we'll have to be, the American people will decide that someone must be punished. There must be some punishment for presidential criminality. They're not prepared to have the president impeached, it looks like, and it looks like the Republicans won't proceed. There's going to be a, have to, but there's going to have to be a punishment. Censure is, is unconstitutional, and I think the punishment that is going to end up being meted out is on poor Al Gore. They're going to say, that's the solution, defeat Al Gore in 2000, and that's Clinton's punishment. And uh, I think Clinton, in his cynical way, will smile and accept that deal. Okay, thank you, uh, David Frum and E.J. Dion, and thank you.
I'm Ben Wattenberg for Think Tank. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C. 20036. Or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. And please let us know where you watch Think Tank. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.